Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode focuses on peace on Earth, abolition of nuclear weapons of war, and ending nukes and imagining nonviolence. We're looking at the important issue of peace being a human right for everyone on Earth, and the recent doomsday clock announcement that the world stands at 90 seconds to midnight reminds us that we must build a stronger movement, more effective, more cooperative nuclear abolition to prevent nuclear war and advance disarmament. Today, I'm joined by Jackie, founder of Abolition 2000. Jackie, can you explain to us the doomsday clock and where we are at this time in history? The doomsday clock was established by the Bolton, the Bolton of the Atomic Scientists, I think in 1947, uh, to, uh, to try to graphically convey how close the world was to uh, annihilation. Initially, they focused pretty much exclusively on nuclear weapons, which were new to the world at that time. Uh, over the years, they have added other existential threats, notably climate change. More recently, um, disinformation exacerbated by artificial intelligence and things like that. In any case, the farthest it's ever been, I think, is 17 minutes to midnight when the Cold War ended. Then there was a kind of a collective sigh of relief around the planet. People thought that uh, nuclear weapons were a thing of the past and largely forgot about nuclear weapons. But the nuclear threat never really abated and has been increasingly um visible in the last few years, especially since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and now with the Israeli war on Gaza, we have two hot wars involving nuclear armed states with the dangers of greater escalation of those wars, which could lead to nuclear escalation. So last year, the, the doomsday clock was set at 90 seconds to midnight, and that was the closest it had ever been. This year, it remains at 90 seconds to midnight. And as the uh, bulletin explains, this should not uh, be interpreted as thinking that we have reached some kind of state of stability. In fact, it's a reaffirmation of how dangerously close we are. Thank you so much. It's really important for people to know where we're at, because as you said, after the Cold War, there seemed to enter a point where people thought that all the aspects about nuclear weapons and annihilation had sort of just been removed. I remember there was all those films and movies that were there that then sort of captivated our imagination. Could you share with us some of the most important highlights in the nuclear abolition movement that really did pique everyone's interest, but more importantly, raise the horrors of the annihilation that humanity could easily face? I can say that if we think back to uh, 1982, that was kind of the height, I think, the peak of the anti-nuclear movement in the United States, certainly, and globally in many respects. Because at that time, the United States under Ronald Reagan had begun deploying nuclear-armed cruise and Pershing missiles to Europe. And people in Europe were terrified that they were going to be on the battleground of World War III. It was at the height of the Cold War and tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. That was the year that there were a million people gathered in Central Park in New York City to call for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And there were uh, demonstrations around the world that year. And the next year, I myself was arrested at the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Laboratory in California with about 5,000 other people. Uh, so the, the, the nuclear weapons were really, um, I think it, it, I think at the height of, pu of public awareness and concern. And that movement continued through the 1980s to you know, greater or lesser extent. We had the freeze movement in the United States where we had um, ballot initiatives in most states calling for a halt and freeze the nuclear arms race. Uh, and then in 1989, all of a sudden, the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended. Nobody was expecting that. Nobody, including the National Intelligence Services, were expecting that. And like I said, it was people, it was almost like 
the planet breathed a collective sigh of relief. And activists, at the time it was a young movement, Act that young activists moved on, had families, got involved in other issues, uh, Central America, anti-intervention work there, anti-apartheid work, environmentalism. And the issue really disappeared. It's almost like it fell off a cliff. But within the nuclear armed states, the nuclear weapons juggernaut continued. And in the United States, for example, in 1991, uh, Colonel not Colonel, um, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, said we no longer have the luxury of having a specific enemy to plan for. We have to plan for <laughs> every many enemies. And that very much is being echoed now in the U.S. nuclear war planning, which is contemplating two wars with two nuclear armed states at the same time. That would be one with Russia and one with China. So. In the nuclear weapons establishment, um, the planners at the nuclear weapons labs continued to come up with rationales for and designs for new nuclear weapons systems. The nuclear weapons budget dipped a little bit for a couple of years, then it started to rise, and it is now, in inflation-adjusted dollars, the highest it has ever been on record in the United States. And there are plans and programs underway to maintain, modernize, or replace every warhead and every delivery system in the arsenal. And that uh, kind of activity is being reflected in the other nuclear armed states, in particular Russia, where Putin a couple of years ago announced the development of this of this new generation of you know almost kind of like sci-fi <laughs> weapons, but they are actually starting to be deployed. China, which for many years until now has had a very small arsenal, like 300 weapons, and has kept them uh, in a de-alerted state, is now making plans to massively increase the size of its arsenal and build a lot more missiles. Um, the UK is involved in modernizing its Trident submarines. R France is working on a new missile. Um, Israel, the ghost in the machine, so to speak, is ma maintains a nuclear triad like the United States does. It has strategic bombers. It has um, land-based missiles and it has submarine-based missiles. And then we have India, Pakistan, and we have North Korea, which is testing a lot of missiles and is possibly preparing for another full-scale nuclear test. So we have a new generation of arms racing underway now. It's costing bazillions of dollars <laughs> and it's happening at the same time as we have these very heightened tensions among and between nuclear armed states and their allies, I mentioned the two wars. Those are, those are not the only hotspots. There's also US, China, and particularly a potential conflict over the status of Taiwan. In the future, we have continuing tensions and political instability in India and Pakistan. And then we have the Middle East where the, the uh, Israel's war in Gaza is threatens to expand. Now we have the U.S. bombing in Syria, uh, I believe Jordan and Iraq, and we don't know how Iran is going to respond. Uh, I do want to say Iran does not have nuclear weapons at this point, but they do have the potential to develop them. Um, Saudi Arabia is keeping a close eye on what Iran is doing, and it also wants to, you know, have a bomb in the back pocket if if it decides it's time to do so. We're in a very, very volatile, dangerous situation. And I do think that 90 seconds to midnight, you know, is is appropriate. No, oh, and it's it's actually makes so much more sense now. You can almost hear the clock ticking with each example that you're providing. And then we really appreciate you connecting all the dots of how it what does exist now, which is horrible and horrendous, could expand very rapidly. With and I, I should I want to mention something else too. I for I, two other things aspects. One is that the U.S. has nuclear weapons deployed in uh, five uh, European countries, five NATO countries, 
and it's about to redeploy nuclear weapons to the Lake and Heath base in the UK, which it had withdrawn its its weapons, its nuclear weapons, many years ago from there, and is up upgrading um, the B sixty one gravity bomber to give it more precision uh, targeting, and that's those will be deployed in Germany and elsewhere, and other countries like Poland. Other NATO members like Poland are asking for U.S. nuclear weapons. So again, you have this this modernization activity going on, not just in the U.S. but also among its uh, uh, strategic allies. And the other point I want to make, which is very important, is that this is all happening at a time when we see growing numbers of authoritarian nationalist leaders and governments around the world in Russia, in China, in North Korea, in Hungary, in Israel, and the United States. Um, so that's another really dangerous aspect to this because when you have increasing uh, rallying around national identities and nationalism, and you have authoritarian leaders, and they have nuclear weapons, <laughs> What what more need I say? It's very dangerous. It is a recipe for a human rights disaster. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. One point I was interested in was, what first inspired you to dedicate your life to peace? As you went through those history and yeah. even those aspects, what was it personally that brought you in and drives you to this day? Well, I have to go back to my childhood. My parents um, were Jewish. They had lived through World War II. They were very um, cognizant of the danger and dangers of the resurgence of anti-Semitism. And, you know, boy, were they right. <laughs> um, but they taught us, my, me and my brother, they were also very cog cognizant of current events. So as a family, we would watch the news on TV together every night and discuss it. So um, they taught me and my brother that the... Nazi Holocaust that could can never happen again, and you need to be, stand up and be counted. So that was one really early influence. Um, another was the civil rights movement. I grew up watching Martin Luther King again on television, and it, in the North, in New York at the time. And then my family made a couple of trips to car trips to the South, and where I saw segregated bathrooms and segregated restaurants and stuff and I was just shocked um and I and when Martin Luther King was assassinated I remember my family put a candle in the window and we were mostly white families there we were probably the only ones but that made a huge huge difference as well so then and when I was in high school the, the U.S. was involved in the Vietnam War and so I was involved in student activism draft counseling and efforts to, you know, I, I remember at my high school graduation, I organized uh, wearing of black armbands and, and peace symbols on our, you know, those hats, whatever those things are called, <laughs> those graduation caps. Um, and then uh, in high school also I had a very progressive um, set of teachers. It was the first, the first Earth Day. Mm. And so we, they inspired the students to organize an ecology group, which I was very involved in and learned about ecology. And at that time, learned about thermal pollution into the ocean from nuclear power. At the time that I was in high school, and I've collaborated this with my colleagues, they did not teach us about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, anyway, so, so that awareness led me to get involved in anti-nuclear power work and then Again, we, as I said, there's the Vietnam War going on, and there was that anti-war work, and then that was also sort of the the first wave of the recent, the modern age of feminism. So there was also um, an emergent feminist movement. Those three things sort of came together for me, you know, ecology, nonviolence, and feminism. And uh, yeah, and, and it went on from there. <laughs> Perfect. And it also brings me to the point where I remember us meeting in Tahiti with Morurua and the French testing there. Could you share how the Tahiti abolition in 2000 was so significant and how there was a link between nuclear colonization 
and the importance of indigenous people's rights. Absolutely. I think I should say something about Abolition 2000. Just briefly, Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons was established in 1995 at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review and Extension Conference. And it was to initially to demand immediate commencement of negotiations on a treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons within a time-bound framework by the year 2000. Um, when, uh, and we rapidly grew to have, uh, to include, you know, countries, member groups around the world. But as 2000 approached and we knew we weren't gonna get our treaty, then uh, we, sought to enroll 2,000 member groups. So that's why we stuck with the name. And in 19, it, we also explicitly in the founding statement call for the phase the elimination of nuclear power. So we've always been opposed to nuclear power as well. So in 1997, we had our second annual general meeting in uh, French occupied Polynesia. Uh, at the invitation of, of an indigenous-led group called Hititao, which means, I think it means the time is now. And it was an extraordinary meeting because it brought together anti-nuclear activists, peace activists from North America, from Europe, and from many of the Pacific Island nations, including people who had not actually seen each other for many years. And when we were there, we really got an education about the full scope of impacts of the nuclear enterprise on colonized and indigenous people because French Polynesia had been the site of France's um, above ground and underwater nuclear test explosions and the populations there were experiencing what populations exposed to nuclear testing everywhere experience help with health effects, environmental impacts, intergenerational effects, and so on. And also, their France, uh, the French Polynesia is still an occupied colony. And mo most of the nuclear weapons tests around the world ha have been conducted on lands of indigenized and indigenous and colonized people. So we really learned about nuclear colonialism as a term that was kind of coined and it was an extraordinary experience for many reasons, but one was that I learned a lot about the sort of history uh, of the colonized people. So very similar to Hawaii, of course, um, and the fact that there were different, um, different self-declared or recognized by some people, indigenous-led monarchies and governments sort of vying for supremacy. Hiti Tao is interesting, our host, because they were not, they're not a political party and they they said it was too they felt it was too soon to be engaged in uh in independence uh, activity. What they wanted to do was to reclaim and regrow re a sustainable indigenous economy that would put them in a position to be self-sufficient uh, in the future. So that was another interesting dimension of it. Oh, it was definitely one of the most powerful weeks of my life as well. Uh, it was it was the nonviolent peaceful protest with the Fafaru that they had gone into the parliament building. Yes. It, exciting uh, court monitoring that Abolition 2000 did while there. It was also, as you said, really the circular economy with people, uh, the women's co-op with the vanilla and the coconut oil, the manoi and all those different aspects, really everything coming together. And then all of us recognizing as well that nuclear, of course, is permanent, is forever, and was impacting even the fish. And you could see how people living sustainably would be directly impacted by those tests that had happened so far. Did issue the Morea Declaration, recognizing the uh, uh, disproportionate suffering of indigenous and colonized people from the nuclear cycle, and that became kind of an appendix to the Abolition 2000 statement. Very important. It's true, and it also reminded me too. Even I remember it was it was really a non-commercial week. That really living there, it was everyone was there for mutual exchange taking care of each other. And you could really see 
how the indigenous values were exercised and coordinated. And that week really did, I think, build and bring life into the anti-nuclear movement. As you said, nuclear colon colonialism really became a more recognized term. And if you do look around at the history of nuclear testing, it is always on indigenous people's sacred homelands and brought it all together. One other important aspect of the amazing work you do is Mayors for Peace. And I remember seeing you a couple of years uh, in Honolulu at the Mayors for Peace conference. Can you share a bit about that? Sure. Well, Mayors for Peace, going back to that seminal year of 1982, was founded uh, during the United Nations Second Special Session on Disarmament, where the mayors, the, at the time, the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki announced the formation of this international mayors movement to call for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And that uh, movement has grown now to include about oh, over 8,200 cities in uh, 166 countries and territories and um, has been very active carrying the message that the, the Hibakshas message, message, the A-bomb survivors message that, you know, nuclear weapons and human beings are incompatible and nuclear weapons must be abolished. But over the years, they've also, well, actually, they've come full circle because in their original covenant, Mayors for Peace did recognize the linkage to a lot of other issues, poverty, uh, refugees, and so on. And in the last couple of years, last 10 years, they've been developing now a kind of a three-pronged approach, which is calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons, promotion of safe and resilient cities, and creating a culture of peace in which peace is a priority for every individual. And those three things they see as being the essential components of achieving a sustainable, lasting world peace. And so this, in different parts of the world, this cities, member cities are encouraged to link up their uh, nuclear abolition advocacy with you know, whatever the other, you know, issues of, of local concern to them, and such as in some parts of the world, terrorism, refugees, certainly, poverty, certainly, environmental issues, certainly, and so on. So it's another somewhat holistic approach. I do think that before we run out of time, we should mention, and maybe you were going to bring this up, we just had our 28th annual general meeting of abolition 2000 virtually we've done them virtually since the pandemic and it allows for a lot more international participation from all over the world but we were really excited to have the participation of a youth group from tahiti um which has gave a fantastic presentation a youth group which focuses on nuclear abolition and climate change. And we had another fabulous presentation from a youth group from Kazakhstan, which was the site of the Soviet Union's principal nuclear test site. Uh, and they're called STEP, S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, STEP Organization for Peace, STOP. And they gave a fabulous presentation focusing on the need for nuclear abolition and 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 compensation to um, victims of nuclear testing, but also calling for Soviet decolonization of Kazakhstan and a feminist foreign policy for Kazakhstan. So I'm just really impressed with these, these new emerging movements of young people picking up the work of their parents and grandparents in, in, in these directed, directly affected um, communities. And it's a great example, really, because Abolition 2000 movement does draw on the experience of longtime activists and the energy and innovations of young campaigners. And as you said, it, it was a celebration of the 28th, 8th, but it also links many of the issues that you're talking about of sustainability, resilience. We know that Maui, as well as Kauai, Hawaii, and Honolulu are all signed on to mayors for peace. We also, though, as you made the connections, the recent UN Human Rights Committee review of the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights and its general comment it just released 
and the campaigns have been done around the Universal Periodic Review is climate change, nuclear war, and human right to life. Maybe you can share a bit about this interconnectedness and how Abolition 2000 is going forward to make sure that we can realize UN Sustainable Development Goal number 16 for peace and justice around our globe. Well, it seems that uh, people who are working on a variety of issues are all sort of grasping for the idea of how to work together more effectively to build a more powerful unified movement. That seems to be a very broad theme. And um, I, I will say about uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 16, I think <laughs> we need to see that, I mean, peace and, and, and human security are, or whatever the term used in that, in that article, are kind of buried in this other article. It's not a full point itself. And I think that in the next iteration of Sustainable Development Goals, it, it really needs to be a point on its own of peace, you know, um, peace, because otherwise the other ones are, are, are always at risk. Um, in the United States, and Hawaii is, a, you know, like it or not, part of the United States. Um, but we, there is an emerging movement, which is also trying to seeking to bring everybody together, which is called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which I think has a great deal of potential. Um, a year before he was killed, Martin Luther King gave a speech called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence, where he identified the triple evils of systemic racism, systemic poverty, and uh, militarism. And the, the, he was assassinated exactly one year later, and I don't think that was a coincidence. Um, so his work has been picked up now by the new Poor People's Campaign, led by Reverend William Barber II and Reverend Liz Theo Harris, and they've added to the triple to the triple evils of systemic racism, systemic poverty, uh, militarism in the war economy, environmental devastation, and a distorted moral narrative that blames poor people for their own poverty. And they say these things are all intertwined and are woven together through a moral fusion campaign. So I think that moral fusion is a very good way to think about the path to building this broader, more unified movement that we need to, to survive. Really important. And while we're talking about the civil and political rights under the Human Rights Committee and how they've had that new general comment, it really is important to look at the economic, social, and cultural rights, which has never been addressed or recognized as much in our country. And I really appreciate you bringing those economic, social, and cultural rights together because it is environment, it is economy, it is ecology, it is equity, and we have to bring all that together to be able to understand what matters most. What would you say would be the next steps for Abolition 2000 after this important AGM? Well, the, uh, we have to go through, we, the coordinating committee, has to go, we have to go through the chats and we have to go through our own notes and the report backs from the breakout groups and really pull out things. There are a lot of good ideas that were expressed. And so I think the first thing is we need to take the energy that was evident during the weekend and the theme was um, keeping the network connected and really think about how to operationalize some of these ideas. I mean, I just want to stress that Abolition 2000 is a network, and the work is done by the member groups, and our job is to put those groups in touch with each other and give them the some kind of support they need to carry out these projects. We will be working towards a series of um, events in July in Geneva during the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Preparatory Committee meeting there. And we'll do us we'll do some street art. We'll do some workshops. We'll make, make statements to the uh, official governments, and have some informal meetings there. So that's our next big event. Um, we're also looking at then the next 
meeting, the third meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which will be in March of 2025. Uh, but we'll be, you know, we have a couple of working groups. For example, there's one called Nuclear Weapons Convention Reset, which is uh, saying it's taking a fresh look at the model nuclear weapons convention that Abolition 2000 produced or came out of Abolition 2000 in 1997 originally, which focuses again on the nuclear weapons states, the nuclear armed states, and their legal obligations and moral obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and customary international law to actually implement nuclear disarmament. The countries without nuclear weapons have done their part by negotiating and, and ratifying the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. However, as long as no nuclear armed state or its ally joins that treaty, it cannot be a disarmament treaty. So we still need a disarmament treaty. And, uh, you know, that's what that's what we'll be, be working for. But I think Abolition 2000 will be seeking to, we're, we are going to be uh, attempting to rebuild our youth network, our youth fusion network, with the energies from these new youth groups that I mentioned. And that will be a, a priority. And um, we'll also be continuing to seek ways to make common cause with uh, the climate movement in particular. Um, if I have time, I mean, there's one thing that that's really has struck me because we've been trying for years now to approach the climate change activists and say there are two existential threats. Let's work together. And that argument doesn't seem to have stuck. It hasn't seemed to have been very effective. And something that occurred to me during the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons meeting of states parties in New York in November was it was happening at the same time as COP28, when the U.S. and about 20 other countries went into COP28 with a commitment to a pledge to triple <laughs> production of commercial nuclear energy over the next 30 years. And here we were listening to the testimonies of uranium miners and their families and their communities, the victims of nuclear testing, the people who've been affected by, at all nuclear waste, at all parts of the fuel chain. And I think that we need to get those testimonies into the climate movement so that young activists who may be bamboozled into thinking that nuclear energy is a solution to climate change understand what that means in terms of its human impacts and its effects on indigenous and frontline communities. So that's one thing I'd like to see a lot more uh, developed a lot more. So thank you so much, Jackie, and we appreciate your insights and more important, your dedication to peace and human rights. We thank everyone for watching Cooper Union. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and aloha. Mahalo.